All right. Well, great. I'm so honored to be able to moderate this panel on Oceania with two magnificent guests who will give us insights and new perspectives from New Zealand and Australia. You have their brief bios on the website, so I've asked them to let me share with you just a little bit about what they're currently working on. Catherine Irons of Victorian, Victoria University says she can't say no to interesting environmental law projects, probably a problem that a lot of us have. And she's now working on a range of things, including academic articles, books, chapters, and edited books, as well as environmental court cases on a water conservation order and a wetland. Some topics are more practical, such as liability for climate adaptation and current laws on deep seabed mining. And some are more theoretical, such as fundamental environmental principles and earth jurisprudence. Earlier this year, a documentary and accompanying Apple podcast was published about her work. It's really extraordinary and you should get a hold of it if you can. Michelle Maloney, our second guest on this panel, is the National Coordinator of Australian Earth Laws Alliance and an associate with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. She's currently preparing for AELA's Biennial Rights of Nature Earth Laws Conference online in a, just a couple of weeks, the 14th through 16th of October. And she's working on drafting a rights of nature law for the Barca Darling River, a major riverway in Australia. I'm sure we'll have lots of, to talk about. So Catherine, why don't you start us off? Okay, thanks for that, Erin. Um, so uh, I've been asked to um, comment on some recent developments in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I'll probably just short it to New Zealand for most people. Um, and so there have been a lot of developments in relation to earth laws generally um, and rights of nature uh, examples. Um, quite a few uh, of a wide range of types, but I thought um, the one that most people seem to be most interested in as the most dramatic um, and different from what we uh, do in our regular um, our regular systems of you know property and uh, I guess our regular legal systems generally um, is to accord personality to nature, legal personhood to natural features such as a river, a mountain, and a national park. Those are the, the three that have been agreed to so far. Um, so th they all have common features, uh, but I thought what I'd do is I'd pick one that most people seem to be, I guess, most enamored with, which is the one in relation to the river. It was also the first one. And so if I go through what I think are some particular interesting features about our application um, of legal personhood or what people often refer to as rights of nature um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and then stand back and say what I think are some more interesting lessons. And then if we have time, we can look back later at some of the other examples. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, I've actually got two screens. We're going to see if I can pick the right one for the PowerPoint, which has got lots of pretty pictures. Um, I just have to get someone to enable my screen sharing, which has been taken off me. <laughs> um, but one day, you now I can choose this one, the PowerPoint share, and then I choose. So I'm hoping that what you see is not is the full screen of my main slide um, nature as an ancestor uh, if you don't see that then let me know <laughs> um, so the maybe i'll start with three takeaways that i think are the most important me, points Catherine, to, yes just so you know we can see your notes as well you might want to hit slideshow so yeah. okay yeah. well there's Resume slideshow. I look. I'm so I've got the first the problem of two screens and it doesn't seem to want to. No, no, we can see it anyway. I don't want to complicate it. I just want to let you know sometimes no. it's hard to see what your screen. No, doing. no, no, no. That's what I'm saying. One screen has got the little tiny bits, all the notes, and the second screen has just got like you would see the slideshow, but it's we're seeing the notes. But I think that's okay. What? You continue. Well, I don't mind, but that means you only see a teeny tiny little thing, right? You only see this teeny tiny bit. Okay, maybe I will. I will do this. It's just really weird. Sorry about that. That's what I tried to figure out beforehand to switch screens. And, um, oh, ah, oh, switch. 
duplicate slideshow. No, <laughs> that one. Ha! <laughs> there we go. So, three takeaways. Got it. Well done. There we go. I duplicated my screen. Uh, all these high tech things um, that I should have figured out by now. Um, so, three key points about the examples um, in New Zealand is that our legal personality was accorded as part of a human rights process. It was an indigenous, um, indigenous claim to reparations for having land taken away. Um, so there's the first one was a human rights or indigenous rights process. We've, as a result, implemented responsibility and guardianship models. Um, and they have accorded legal personality as a result of that, but it's the responsibility framework which was the focus. And you happen to have a statement about according rights, but it's also rights and responsibilities. Um, and then the key thing I think that's most important is it changes the status in our minds. We now suddenly don't own this land anymore, but we are responsible for it. Um, so the one example of the river uh, is Te Awatupua, and I just showed the brief map, um, which starts in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand. And you can see the blue line on the left or on the right there, it starts near some mountains in the middle and flows down towards the coast. Um, it is New Zealand's longest navigable river, um, and it flows through this national park, as well as through farmland. Um, and it's uh, one of the most popular tourist attractions um, for kayaking uh, and, you know, general uh, travels up and down the river. Um, because it's wide and uh, in a lot of places, it's one of the most um, stable part of being navigable. It's not as, uh, not as many rapids as some of our rivers. Um, and Māori have used it for navigation, um, as well as uh, fishing, but as the general transport route, you know, um, since they settled the area, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, the Māori view is of the river as a living ancestor. So Māori, the indigenous peoples of New Zealand, have a different relationship with their natural world. And they have the saying about this particular river, um, ko o te awa, ko te awa ko o, it's I am the river and the river is me. And so, and they do mean it literally, but they also don't mean it literally. They mean it wider in a wider sense that they're just simply intrinsically connected, that the health and the well being of the river is intrinsically connected with the health and well being of the people. So that would be the not transliteral um, translation. Um, and the, um, the Māori have been fighting for control over the river since colonisation um, under control of the government. We call it the Crown here. They've had lots of riverbed works, gravel extraction, water diversions, um, interfered with the Māori fishing, uh, traditional activities um, and navigation, um, as well as all, all the various uses, including the riparian rights when land was taken away. So various objections have been lodged. Uh, now the word there, iwi, that's the uh, Māori word for tribe. And they've had numerous court cases. It's often referred to as New Zealand's longest running court case, you know, from the early 1900s. As a result of negotiations over historical grievances, generally between different tribes throughout New Zealand and the government, um, there was an agreement reached uh, with the iwi, the tribes up and down the Whanganui River, um, to negotiate over their historical grievances in, in, in the 2010s. And in 2012, they came to this agreement um, that they would respect the traditional tribal view of the river as an ancestor. And, the, and so they've agreed to put this, they're calling it an awa, the awa is the Māori name for the river, and te awa tupu, it's like the, the ancestral river, um, it's like the river grandfather almost, um, comprises the Whanganui River as an indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating its tributaries. And here's the most important part here, the physical and metaphysical elements. So they're acknowledging that the river has a spirit. So there's a definition of the river, which is not just the physical. And for political reasons, it doesn't actually include the water either. But it's a separate story um, because we have problems with ownership of water in New Zealand. Um, so they've put that phrase, ko o te awa, ko te awa ko o, into the legislation. Uh, and they've translated it into English as well. 
um, where they have that inalienable, so the iwi and hapu, that's the tribes and sub-tribes of the Whanganui River, have an inalienable connection with and responsibility to Te Awatupua and its health and well-being. So that then, what they then agreed to do was implement a framework to uphold that responsibility. And the key part of that was an agreement to recognize it as a legal entity with standing in its own right so that nobody owned it. And here's the, the ultimate political compromise with these historical grievance claims. The tribes were arguing for return of ownership and the Crown, the government saying, nah, we can't return that. Um, to you that would not be politically acceptable to everybody else. Um, so they said, well, how about as a compromise, nobody owns the river. And so that was the one that was most acceptable. Um, so they recognize it as a legal entity of its own. So this was the agreement in 2012 um, that it will be incapable of being owned and its innate values will be recognized and provided for. Uh, and that's what they, it took a few years from 2012 to 2017 to negotiate all the details between all of the government and other stakeholders, local government, central government, various departments, the various owners up and down the river, the, all the, the, in, the in people who have interests in the river. Uh, took them that five years to sort out the details and then they passed this legislation saying it was a legal person with the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person. And that was really just a stock phrase. Um, it's interesting, it doesn't have the same status for any of, uh, for all the different purposes and different legislation. Sometimes for some purposes, it's a body corporate, for others, it's a public entity. But key in terms of that different view of the river is that its title to the river bed was vested in itself as like in the, the body corporate. Um, but as I mentioned, not the water itself. And there are 26 other statutes that uh, this, Te Awa Tupu Act 2017 effects. Um, key to all of this was implementing this guardianship model, which is what the tribes were arguing for. They wanted to be recognized as the collective guardians for the river. That word for guardianship is kaitiakitanga in Māori, and that's used throughout the legislation. So it recognized the Māori concept of kaitiakitanga, and it appointed two guardians to the office of te po, te po tupu. The po is like a pole. So that's the guardian pole. Um, and those guardians must promote and protect the health and well-being of Te Awatupua. That's the duty in the legislation to act and speak on behalf of Te Awatupua and act in its interests and consistently with Tupua Te Kawa, which is the intrinsic values uh, of um, the river. So these two guardians is like one from the crown and one from the tribes. And the, the eight tribes up and down the river agree on who their tribal po um, representative will be. Um, so, oh, uh, an interesting order. The PO is supported by a number of uh, other entities to help give effect to guardianship. One is a smaller advisory group, so we could say it's more like the, um, the office, but it also has a much larger strategy group, um, up to 17 stakeholder representatives, including the eight iwi, as local and central government, as conservation reps, recreation group reps, and tourism and electricity generator, because there's an electricity um, uh, generating uh, uh, hydroelectric power station at the top near the uh, top of the river near the mountains. Yeah. Um, and it's supported by a $30 million fund um, to help restore the health and well-being of the river. So um, notice all of this focus was, and throughout the negotiations for this, was a focus on responsibilities of people. It's not what we would call here rights of nature. Um, even if it fits, even if the tools used fit within that wider framework. So it's targeted at cultural redress rather than environmental improvement. There was some responsibility to improve aspects of um, the health of the river, but more of it was about the Māori responsibility to do that. Um, a key aspect for, again, a different view of the river for that idea of it being an ancestor um, and having a different relationship is recognition of its intrinsic worth. Um, but the rights, apart from that, and the statement that it has rights, they aren't defined otherwise. And it does involve that transfer of property to enable um, an explicit co-governance framework and core responsibilities um, to be exercised. 
Um, so if you wanted to put this into a summary, um, it is a responsibility framework rather than a rights framework. And the key rights involved though um, are human rights, they're indigenous rights of reparations and cultural rights to recognition of indigenous cosmology. Uh, this, this, this cosmology, this view of the world that we see nature differently and we want that put into statute. And so in that sense, we don't regard them as rights of nature, even though we know they're using the same tools. Um, and you can loosely put it in what you'd call a rights of nature framework, but it's just not the way we would label it here. So, but yes, yeah, an excellent illustration of the rights of nature tools and how they might operate. Um, I know you've looked at other approaches worldwide. So if you just fit it into that framework, you can see our bases. There are various, there's a whole range of different legal bases for implementing legal personhood for nature worldwide. And some of them are a human rights framework. It could be indigenous or not. Why do they, some of them are rights of nature frameworks. Some of them involve responsibility and particularly the human responsibility to or for nature. And I know the Indian examples refers to constitutional duties. So there are lots of different bases for utilizing the same tools. Um, but all of them have some kind of method of ensuring responsibility, whether it's legal personhood um, on its own and then individuals stand up to try and exercise the rights to, uh, um, uh, to enforce that, um, or if the, a separate legal guardianship model might be set up, uh, whether it's legislation or by courts. And then that leads into that method of creating. Sometimes it's through going to court and sometimes it's through statute. In New Zealand, it's been through statute. Um, that's the only thing that's worked here, but we have a parliamentary sovereignty system here where parliament is sovereign. There is no higher constitution um, for courts to be you know, referring legislation to. Um, what is really key is that we have explicit duties imposed for current and future generations. Um, and it does, I think, all, uh, represent that new relationship because in our case, we explicitly put in the ancestral relationship with the river. Um, uh, so it tells you why we've got this legal personhood status. Um, it's not just like a corporate tool. Um, it's very different. So what I think is important for that new status is this difference. It takes it away from the Greco-Christian view that um, everything is for our benefit, right? Um, the animals, the wild, right? Uh, to, that's not just there to furnish us with clothes and it's not, it's not under all our control, right? For our, for our purpose and benefit. It, I mean, this view here underlies certainly the Western, all the Western legal systems and this is quite often referred to the Blackstone commentaries, right, Blackstone, um, that, comment, that says that that Bible view that God, the creator, gave to men dominion over everything, right, the plants and um, the animals, is the only true and solid foundation of our dominion, that, that religious view, um, whatever metaphysical notions may have been started by other writers and that view is what underlies our property and then property individually as well as the whole of states and their control of property so it underlies most uh, you know most of the legal systems in the world in that sense um, so when we adopt a legal personhood framework and especially one that recognizes an ancestral view of the river we are changing our mindset and so we're we're targeting that bottom peak at the bottom of the, the iceberg where it's the mental model that might give rise to the systems we implement and then our human behavior um, over time. So we're really targeting that bottom uh, mindset mental model with this. Um, it represents um, views, indigenous views around the world. Um, this is a real common one from the, the Sioux view that uh, we don't own the buffalo right there are brothers right we come from them so that nature as an ancestor it's not peculiar to indigenous peoples in new zealand and i'm sure michelle can also you know have something to say about that in relation to australia um so it, it does tie into that human right to a healthy environment and i do love this idea that environment is humanity's first right but we go further and then we don't we're not just talking about rights we're talking about a human right to exercise responsibility um, and that's the invisible goal here. So we say that 
the rights are these useful tools, but responsibility for nature is the one that probably needs to be made more explicit through the establishment of guardianship structures, for example, which is what um, we've done with our legislation. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, and this, I think, is a great way to, what do you call, paraphrase, um, or to identify this different model, ko'o te awa, ko te awa ko'o, um, kia ora tato. And I will, I can stop my screen share. Thank you More so much, to have Questions about any of those examples or any other types of ones of Earth jurisprudence. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, we really, really uh, learned a lot from that. Um, now we'll hear from Michelle, who's going to sort of take us to the worldviews uh, that she works with in Australia. Um, and then, and I do invite questions in the Q&A uh, section of, the, of, the, um, of your Zoom screen. Thanks. Michelle. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share screen. I hope that everyone is well, and I hope that you've had a wonderful uh, conference. I think we're coming at the end, so I'll try to be chirpy and cheerful. And may I say that tomorrow is looking beautiful. So for everyone who's already in the yesterday, the Thursday, welcome to Friday. So my name's Michelle Maloney, and I'm with the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. Um, and what I'd like to do first is we have a really um, important and rapidly emerging practice amongst non-Indigenous Australians that at the beginning of a meeting or a talk that we should acknowledge country. Um, for those who don't know about um, First Nations people's culture in Australia, um, there's a plethora of beautiful books and writings by Aboriginal people themselves that I urge you to have a look at. Um, but a simple non-Indigenous explanation is acknowledging the land on which I live and work and play acknowledging the elders past, present and emerging, saying the name of the Aboriginal and First Nations peoples whose country this is, that me as part of the colonial legacy on this continent is now privileged to live on the land um, that was cared for for millennia by Aboriginal peoples. And the Yagara and Turrbal peoples are those whose land I'm living on here in Brisbane, in Queensland, Australia. And in particular, that little picture is the beautiful water lilies in a water hole that's near my place. Um, and the name of where I live, Banyo, is actually an Aboriginal, the local Aboriginal word for ridge. And that place is um, Najinanda, black duck water hole. So um, it's a remnant and it's beautiful. And it's very important for people like myself in Australia. And I'll talk about the decolonizing efforts that we're all part of to actually put your feet in the soil take your head out of the clouds now and then and just listen to the land. And even for a kid like me, he grew up in the bush and now I live down near the estuaries and the waterways and the oceans. Um, there is nothing more grounding than thinking about nature, being in nature, talking about nature and respecting it and also respecting the first peoples and the first laws. So acknowledgement of country is important as an Aussie, um, but I'm not indigenous. I do acknowledgement of country, never a welcome to country. So what I would like to talk about, I, and thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I always love your talks. There's so much information in there. And as many people would agree, um, the developments in New Zealand, particularly that became quite famous in 2017, but many of us were watching it before that, um, were really inspiring to so many jurisdictions and individuals and communities. And hearing the detail of, of how that's all been put together is really terrific. I'm going to start with a slightly bigger picture view of what we're doing in Australia rather than delve into the detail, but I will include analysis of what we're trying to do on the ground. Um, so, and you have to excuse me, I'm a bit out of breath, I had to chase, I had to turn the video off, my dog was chasing me around. So there's always a dog story when I'm doing Zooms at home. <coughs> so the Australian Earth Laws Alliance was founded in 2012 by a group of really wonderful environmental lawyers. We were all deeply concerned about the role that our so-called profession was playing in the destruction of the living world. Um, since forming in 2012, we've, we started in a multidisciplinary fashion, but I must say that our work now is truly focused on systems change. It includes changing structural elements of law, economics, education, all of these underpinning structures of industrial society. Um, and we still have a really strong focus on the law, but we have so many other folks working on different projects in our network. We see rights of nature as one of the many possible ways to stimulate systems change. But our master plan, our desire, our goal as non-Indigenous Aussies working in partnership with First Nations peoples in Australia is to shift our whole society towards an Earth-centred worldview, an Earth-centred mindset, culture and daily practice. That's really the simplicity of it. 
but obviously the complexity of that is, is quite tough. Our inspiration, and I'm sure other folks are already involved in this kind of thinking and work with Earth jurisprudence, but I guess I really want to articulate that Thomas Berry's book, The Great Work, was a great influence to me personally in designing the work that Ayla does. And this idea of shifting from a human-centered to an Earth-centered or life-centered worldview is deeply embedded in everything we do. And I'm really glad that Catherine touched on many of these aspects of challenging an anthropocentric worldview, because I don't have to do that. I can jump more into what we're doing in Australia. But I will, of course, mention this book because a lot of people haven't read it. And if you are genuinely um, curious about what Thomas Berry says about the systems change we need to make, this is one of the coolest books you'll ever uh, read. We took this sort of critique of these underpinning structures of industrial society, these four fundamental establishments, and started to respond and think, how can we shift our legal system, economics, education, um, and embrace the powerful potential of religion and faith. Um, we don't take on or challenge religion. That's not our area of interest. Catherine's already talked about the anthropocentrism um, that is um, deeply embedded in Western culture and now globalized uh, Western style culture and law. And it really can't be underestimated. I won't talk too much about it, but it's occasionally good to just remember how incredibly deep the ideas within our culture go so thousands and thousands of years back to the ancient Greeks um, about human beings being the central fact and purpose and higher plan for the, for the entire purpose of the universe. I won't talk too much about Ayla's work, but I guess I wanted to show you a sort of a non-legal twist on how we conceptualize rights of nature as fitting into a broader systems change approach because of the five core themes changing culture is definitely one of the core areas of our work and transforming law and structure is one of five that we focus on and creating alternatives is something that's really important to us and a lot of our work is about showing viable practical sensible ways to transform a whole system and society towards caring for the earth whilst still having some kind of economic system that supports life However, the purpose of my talk today is to talk a bit about what we're doing in Australia um, and particularly the, for us, the critical nexus between human rights and nature's rights is decolonizing our culture. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment when we talk about the work of our sister organization, Future Dreaming, and some of the remarkable insights that um, First Nations people in Australia have about recognizing um, their obligations and the ancestral the rights of ancestral beings so in australia i can't stress enough that literally daily a vital part of our work is highlighting and addressing the ongoing impacts and injustices of colonization so this is a map of australia for those who might be listening and who are not from australia if you can see on the right hand in the middle i'm in brisbane but you can see that we've got this interesting straight lines drawn across our continent. We were settled in 1788, um, and that's relatively new for a lot of the co colonial nations in the world. And interestingly, the Aboriginal peoples of this continent are some of the oldest continuous cultural peoples of the planet. So they've already proven through science that certain communities have not only been in existence on the continent for 50,000 years, but actually in the same bioregion one of the most remarkable um, insights that anthropology has brought forth, which Aboriginal people already knew, is that people have been not just on the continent, but in their local place, part of their land for a phenomenal amount of time. So the modern Australia is built on top of more than 70,000 years. This is thousands of generations more than most cultures on earth. And the in-depth knowledge, understanding and connectivity to land uh, and culture is just remarkable and, and honestly without gushing a phenomenal gift to all of humanity to be able to connect and be part of a journey um, that decolonizes what white fellows have done to this continent and form a new future a better future something that's got pluralism rather than monoism and to that purpose i work with mary graham and a number of other wonderful indigenous elders but I do recommend Mary Graham. One of the reasons I put her photo and name up is if you Google her, try to read as much of her material or find her videos. She's a gift. She's one of Australia's leading thinkers um, and really articulates Aboriginal law and philosophy in a way that's very accessible to, to anybody. It's, and I'm working on a book with Mary called Future Law. And it really is about how we go into the future together and rights of nature and really rearranging the legal system as part of that book. 
that's just a little plug for future dreaming because we're very proud of this partnership approach that we're doing to the work. So if we focus in on some of the work that Ayla has been involved in, um, the possibilities in Australia are very challenging because similar to what Catherine said, we've got the parliamentary system. Um, we, we have apparently one of the oldest continuous written constitutions in the world. We don't tend to have revolutions and change our constitution. Um, out of something like 40 referenda publicly, only six or seven across the hundred years of our constitution have said yes to changing any aspect of the constitution. It's actually really hard to change some of the foundational aspects of Australian law. However, um, we have been watching with great interest what we call these emerging branches of law that are often bundled together as rights of nature. And it was lovely hearing Catherine really articulate that the specific cultural context of what Maori people have argued for and what the compensation agreements um, created in New Zealand, um, technically they're not a straightforward rights of nature law, but they have elements of shifting the legal status of nature. What we see are these two emerging branches of law. And we find it interesting when we're thinking in Australia about how we bring some of these elements in to push people to think differently. So from our point of view, we're seeing these two elements, rights of nature laws articulated across an entire jurisdiction. We see this in the constitution of Ecuador, the national laws of Bolivia, um, those initial laws in Uganda, um, some of the early work by Thomas and Mari, and now Seldef, um, looking at acknowledging the rights of nature and community rights in a local place across a jurisdiction. And this is the approach we took in a draft bill that we worked on with a wonderful, wonderful Greens politician, um, Diane Evers in Western Australia last year. And I can talk about that in a moment. But of course, what we also watch is what's been going on in New Zealand and also the inspiration that's cast into other places in the world to think about acknowledging the legal status differently for particular ecosystems. Um, we, perhaps in our discussion, we might be able to explore how complicated that makes it if you take a tapestry of ecosystems around a continent and give them all legal rights or change their rights without then giving rights to other aspects of the ecosystem. There are some very interesting implementation issues. So I'm per personally probably of the view that we do everything all at once and we just shift the whole system. But exactly as Catherine said, what I'm interested in is how we build the deep responsibility and earth-centered ethic in mainstream or um, non-Indigenous peoples that First Nations peoples have always had. And perhaps some folks argue we had it long ago. Who knows? That seems like a very long time ago if we have to go pre-Greek. Um, but perhaps all human beings have always known somewhere deep down that we are part of this interconnected community of life, which is all pretty fabulous. But as lawyers trying to be tricky and creative and really provoke people into thinking differently so that we can forge real change, um, analysing enough of it to understand it and then to articulate to others how they might do it um, is quite challenging. And let's, let's, be, let's be real, it's fun. It's really fun to play with the legal system. I wanted to mention the Yarra River um, in Australia. This uh, legislation, um, Ayla has had nothing to do with this. We've watched in admiration. Um, it has not changed the legal status of the Yarra River. The, the river still basically belongs to the Crown. But it was remarkable because what happened is the local Aboriginal peoples, the First Nation peoples and others were able to push for the introduction of a new act that recognised the river as a living entity. And it created the Birrarung Council, um, which is First Nation peoples and river keepers, to be spokespersons, um, advisors about the river. Um, and many people see this as first steps towards greater authority by First Nation peoples over their traditional um, ancestor and resources. Um, so it'd be very interesting to watch this. And just a small plug, our, our AILA conference in two weeks has Andrew, um, a gentleman whose name I forget for a moment, um, speaking about this, this uh, river system and the innovative ways they're trying to focus on decolonizing governance of the river. A really important project for AILA has been um, the development of our People's Tribunal. So um, Catherine has given us a wonderful grounding in the in, inner workings of what a law can look like. What we've done by setting up the Australian People's Tribunal, Tribunal for Community and Nature's Rights is create um, a non-government civil society entity that is really just trying to explore and bring together the stories about what's happening to our beautiful environment. And last year, um, 
a number of us went down to a place called um, well, the Darling River, which is one of the longest rivers in Australia, a precious dry land river system. And I won't go into the detail, but do have a look if you're interested. The devastation caused upon this precious ecosystem that is absolutely huge and vital to all of the outback throughout the west of New South Wales and beyond. The devastation caused by um, really terrible management, corruption, excessive irrigation basically um, has been profound. And it is an absolute example of a violation of the rights of the human beings that live along this river, both the First Nations peoples and their cultural and other rights, but also existing small river communities of um, settler people. Um, and throughout our two weeks of public hearings, there was an absolute unanimity in all of the community stories about what the causes of the problem were, what the solutions were, which was to um, create better governance structures led by Aboriginal First Nations peoples along the Barker. Um, and so from it, we're now going, we're working with a couple of folks, I won't talk about too much, uh, in New South Wales Parliament to just play with the concept of what could a, an, an act look like that recognises the legal rights of the river system but in a way, again, as Catherine was saying, in a way that respects First Nations people's deep cultural belief that we are obligated to care for country. So it's not just a sort of typical Western discourse around who has rights, but in fact, trying to frame something that is uniquely Australian, that changes the status of the, the river, recognises the river as a beautiful living entity, not just these chunks of resources that are now being bought and sold and commodified, and have been for a hundred years. So the exploration of the work we're doing around this, it's all normative. None of it's gonna turn into a real law in the next immediate time, um, but playing with these ideas, exploring these ideas and supporting community will um, is a really good example of how human rights and nature's rights are absolutely connected. And the best way to do that has to be built on cultural context. Um, that's just a little link for anyone who does get these slides. That's a link to the draft bill that we prepared for the um, uh, for Greens member Diane Evers to introduce. We knew strategically that this would not be passed. Western Australia, which is a state of Australia, is like my state, Queensland, heavily focused on resource extraction. But generating this kind of bill and having it discussed in a parliament in Australia, that was a, that was a first. Um, and it was very exciting and important and will lead to other developments. Another really interesting um, Aussie flavoured development is um, through work we've done with communities in the Blue Mountains, which is um, a beautiful area west of Sydney. Um, a number of community folks advocated to their local mayor that they engage with concepts around rights of nature. And interestingly, there was a, the council basically resolved to explore what it might look like to bring rights of nature into operations and planning. So this is really different. Um, it's not a law as such, but they are doing the hard work of analyzing what it would mean, both for the economic system, human settlements, developments, planning, to actually have recognized the rights of nature. So we've been working with them on a number of documents and um, yeah, it's very, very interesting and we'll see what happens. That's about all I wanted to cover. There's a ton more work that we're up to but I really did want to plug our Earth Laws conference in two weeks. It's online. So if anyone wants to join us, please just visit our website. Um, there are some websites. And I will leave with a thank you. That is a blue banded bee. That is a uniquely Aussie critter. Um, the females burrow little, little beautiful little nests in my front garden. And the boys just hang around in trees, you know, causing trouble and ruckus. But I just think they're the cutest little bee in the world. And that's enough from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle and Catherine. That was that was really brilliant. Um, your your talks raised so many different kinds of questions. We've had some from the audience, but there are a few that I wanted to just um, start off with. Um, you have already spoken about many different kinds of uh, different approaches, alternatives to rights based approaches, and different ways of thinking about these big questions that we're talking about, the relationship between humans and the environment around us. And I'm wondering if there are, um, if I could ask you to sort of explore a little bit further, if there are any other earth-centered or life-centered approaches that didn't make it into your talk, but that you think are sort of worth exploring or just 
you know, that you want the audience to just consider, be aware of. Um, Catherine, let me start off with you. You're on mute, Catherine. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, there, because I, yeah, I had it, I had it hidden. Uh, the controls were hidden by something else. Um, the what I was going to say. There are probably at least three other earth-centered approaches that we have adopted, um, and they they have even been used. Um, I've actually summarised um, certainly these three in a chapter that's coming out in the Earth Laws textbook. Um, that Grant Wilson and others um, have put together. Um, one, okay, so the notion of guardianship, which I mentioned, ha is in several statutes, and that, for example, decision makers have to uh, pay particular regard to the Māori concept of guardianship and when they're making decisions in relation to natural resources. So there's one, um, you know, maintaining an Indigenous connection, that there's actually a duty to recognise and provide the indigenous spiritual connection with the environment. Um, so that was put into our resource management legislation uh, in order to, for um, indigenous rights reasons, but it upholds that alternative connection. And the government, the, the decision makers, the environment court in New Zealand has said that they have to take into account as a real um, factor a sp spiritual beliefs about the environment. So if you believe a tiny far, a, a mythical, you know, for most people call it a mythical being, if you believe that a spirit inhabits waterways, then the environment court has to take into account or recognize and provide for the in those beliefs about that tiny far. You don't have to agree that it exists, but you have to provide for those beliefs, which is something that most um, environmental laws around the world don't. Um, another version, another uh, tool is to recognize the intrinsic value of nature. And we've got at least seven pieces of legislation, I think, I think it's more, but um, which identify that nature has all particular ecosystems or particular identified pieces, but generally it's that uh, nature has intrinsic value and it's a way of, then decision makers have to figure out how to factor that into whatever decision it's making about, say, the use of that resource. Um, you know, it, which is interesting where they say intrinsic value, yet they still are, it's an often resource-based <laughs> uh, decision making about our use of it. But some of them are, are Reserves Act. And so, you know, you might have a case about, well, can we put a gondola and a viewing platform in, in the reserve that's renowned for a particular ecological or aesthetic beauty. And it's balancing this intrinsic value and then humans, you know, idea to uh, humans need or desires um, to appreciate that value more in a particular way. Right? So there's all sorts of ways you might want to bring it in, but intrinsic value is recognized in quite a few aspects of legislation and it's come before our courts. And then another tool that has argued for um, uh, to, to view part of nature in a different way is to look at animals and their, the, the living, um, I guess, fauna, not just flora. Right? And we've recognized animals as sentient beings, right? as having feelings uh, uh, and emotions. And that is in our animal welfare legislation. Um, it, I must admit, it was put, that was put in in 2015 in response to animal rights activists campaigning for it. And it was when it was agreed to by government, a lot of people thought, well, it's not gonna do that much. You know, it's just a statement of principle. <laughs> it's not gonna actually affect any decision, surely. And yeah, we can stick that in the legislation. Um, but at the same time, others like the SPCA and those who were campaigning said, this is the first step. This is that mental model, right? That's changing. This is the principle we put in there. We put in the principle and one day, you know, eventually we will change the rules that are based on the principle and the decisions and then eventually hopefully our behavior uh, so but yeah it's it's a start and we have quite a few of those kinds of principle-based changes in there can i just add one too we had um a really i thought it was hugely exciting i'm going to write a little piece about it development um i must have been about a week ago I'm part of a, a global network of folks looking at eco-representation and eco-democracy, which can look at different ways of having nature's voice represented in political processes on the um, boards of organizations, et cetera. 
And so we've been looking at these things theoretically and gathering materials. Um, and a, a, a lovely community um, on a small island north of Sydney um, actually got in touch and we drafted a new provision for their constitution. The community is only about 400 people, but they passed a resolution to now have one of the 12 people on their management board or management group uh, speaks for nature. So they must, and we actually articulated what that looks like. I'm going to share it on our AILA website soon. And I'm going to promote that because it's a really nice example of how communities can start thinking about um, nature's voice, nature's rights um, in a way that doesn't rely on sort of the, the government top down approach of changing the law. And it again is another way of changing culture. So it articulated something, I should have put it on the slides. I'm sorry, I forgot, it's too new. Um, something like, you know, that this person has to consider and consult with uh, First Nations and scientific experts on all matters um, discussed by this group and provide advice about what uh, is the best for the living world and provide their recommendations on what should be done and not be done in order to ensure that they're beautiful because it's a really beautiful place. Not all of nature is beautiful, but there's a lot of natural values as some folks would call it. So yeah, eco representation, watch this space. I think it's very groovy. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's uh, I mean, lots and lots of food for thought, right? Um, and I guess my next question had to do with implementation. Now, I think you've, in a way, you've both started to answer that and talk to, sort of recognize that the ideas that we're talking about are sort of paradigm shifting, but at the same time, they're also meant to be practical. So um, if you could each, and here I'll start with you, Michelle, just to maybe pick up on, on your most recent point. Um, if you have additional thoughts about implementation of these ideas, um, I think the audience would love to hear that. Thank you. Um, look, it's a really big issue. I think many folks, and if there's law, I'm sure there's many lawyers on this call, uh, this group, we suffer from the top-down problems of a lack of implementation of well-designed laws that already exist. We see federal and state governments in Australia continually cutting funding, saying they're slashing green tape. But what they do when they gut government agencies and they gut public interest um, processes, removing people to administer and care for registers of environmentally protected place, places, um, cut back on staff, they basically remove capacity for the collective will to enforce um, the environmental laws that are already in place. So there's that top-down problem of funding. Money makes difference if you can put money into having human beings uh, out there caring for country, looking after things. But the other issue, of course, um, in, as well as the lack of government will, the lack of enforcement, are the lack of structures for citizen enforcement. Um, the rise of citizen science um, has made some aspects of taking cases to, to, into the courts better. Um, but I would also say away from the legal system, if we want as communities to build a different future, and this is, I guess, what Ayla is obsessed with, how do we build an earth-centered society? Then there are a lot of other ways to change culture and to build those kinds of approaches. Right now, um, I'm involved with some First Nations leaders, including um, the wonderful Anne Polina from the Kimberley, in building a national network on regenerative projects that are restoring uh, and creating care for the earth. And we feel that this is a very powerful place because we've already got some funders who are uh, really quite interested in this connecting up of a lot of small projects. So I think resources, intent, definitely the enforcement of existing good environmental laws. And, you know, we've got an entire program of how we want to redesign the legal system to be based on bioregional community ecological governance. So they're just some of the issues from my side of things. Um, thank you for the question. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Catherine, did you want to add something about implementation? Sure. I was going to say, it, it's such the, hard, um, the hardest one. And I noticed uh, the difference, like we're about to go into an election here. We're in the middle of campaigning where I think our voting starts um, this, like maybe on Saturday, the advance voting. And the difference between this one and the previous one, the previous one, like the state of water was one of the highest concerns of um, voters and now suddenly economy and jobs uh, in, in a post-COVID, you know, or a mid-COVID world. Um, and, and you realize it's what people 
And what parliament tends, we have a parliamentary sovereignty system, right? And what parliament decides to implement in terms of laws and then what local government wants to implement on the ground and everyone is working, it depends on what people want and what they're responding to. And I think, so like even as an academic, we're not gonna change the world through writing another book chapter. That's what it seems. If we can do it through, which is really sad, you know, you've been doing this all your life, right? <laughs> and and it's and it's like you actually have to persuade voters to elect to pass the laws or to elect the people that pass the laws at a local and a government and a bigger government level. You have to persuade judges. You might have to be writing for audiences, whether it's in decision makers, but also then those who vote in the decision makers about um ways that things could be done differently. Um, we've got huge numbers of things working at all these different levels, but it's like to implement it, so many of them come down to uh, not the fact that a program has been prepared and it's ready to go, it's does a politician want to uh, push the button on that one? Will they get re-elected? Will everybody approve? You know, it's really hard. Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's lots of lots of small examples. I like Michelle's big picture um, approach to it. We've got quite a few small examples of people who are not going to wait for getting legal personality, and they're just going to go for establishing some guardianship arrangements on their local community, a bit like the Yarra River example that Michelle mentioned. Um, we've got Māori communities who say, okay, we want to formalise guardianship and, and they have to negotiate that with decision makers. Right, so that again, it's persuading all of the law community around you that that's a valid and worthy aim. So that, I mean, maybe I, I'm looking at implementation at a, too much of a bigger picture, you know, but that's the kinds of things that we all have to think about and as influences as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we have to be thinking about it in all these different levels. So a uh, big picture and more granular level also. A question from the audience that I think really picks up on that, which is, um, here's the question. Why does the uh, Wanganui River guardianship model actually require a change of mindset if it just deals with human responsibility to manage the river? In other words, oh. are we making more of a deal about this than, than we need to be? Is this just part of what law already does? No, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that you say it requires a change of mindset. I just say that that is one of those things I think will, it will entail. Right. So yeah, you can just pass a law that says this is a legal person and just like a, a corporation. I mean, originally corporations were brand new ideas and now they're just part of our legal landscape, right? And they're just normal. And we don't, we don't know why also, they were invented and they don't know, and we don't know what they're going to do about it. Right. But I do think they're going to, um, they are going to. Entail. Certainly from an outside perspective, um, we were watching the ROU, the record of understanding around the Funganui river. So before it became widely known and when it hit the press, we saw a fundamental shift in Australia. People understood parts of nature, but it seemed to be a faraway concept. When, this legal personhood for all of its flaws, and I don't actually like it as a concept, it's squishing nature into legal personhood. But anyway, it's a stepping stone. But when this idea of recognizing a local system as something other than human property, it really excited people, you know? I, and I can, I can write down examples of all the different communities who picked up on the language that spoke about New Zealand, that spoke about this approach. So um, the mindset is perhaps I mean, the, the legal intricacies are one thing. Most people don't pay any attention to them. They just hear the headliners. But the mm. idea that something changed and this river was no longer just a resource or just property, that idea has been hugely attractive to people who are really frustrated with the system. So um, mm. I think we need a, a, a sort of a collection of different ideas that excite people. I think the eco-representation, um, recognizing li living entities as having their own rights is a way of saying we need to recognize these systems as having a right to exist, thrive, evolve. I don't want to engage at the moment in the details of whether that's legal personhood or a blanket law across a jurisdiction, but these concepts are, you know, they're wonderful. They're just emerging so fast and everyone's really interested. So I don't know if that contributes no, to the conversation. No, I, I do agree. And I, what that has triggered is um, the, the remembrance that this, when it was announced, they'd also got all of the green groups on board. All of the people who, I mean, there are a lot of people who are more 
you know, like there are some people who are really interested in Maori rights and others who want to make sure that the ecosystem is going to be preserved and everybody's got their own little barrow they want to push. And suddenly this one united a whole bunch of different interest groups that weren't otherwise united on other projects that might have been similar. And everybody can said, throw yeah, we one, can support one that. Little, can I throw one little iron in the fire, though? One thing that I'm concerned about is if we move towards the changing the legal status of one ecosystem at a time and acknowledging a fairly narrow group of people as guardians, sometimes, and the Urawera forest seems to be a great example, we take it out of being a national park and into the hands of a very small group of people who, depending on the legal structures, could go ahead and actually exploit that resource beyond its own capacity. So the, the governance structures for these kinds of things really matter. And I think I was really, really encouraged and inspired when we were in our citizens inquiry along the Barker Darling River, everybody was in the same mindset that local communities, all people along the river had to have a say. First Nations peoples should definitely have um, the leadership role because of their unique understanding, connection and rights to place. Um, but there seemed to be this general absolute agreement amongst those who were suffering, really suffering from terrible um, impacts of this you know, dying river system that local communities had to work together to be the people that governments listened to. And this is our problem, this top down structure where far away governments are making decisions, terrible decisions and allowing corporations to take um, resources that are in fact, you know, the, the lifeblood of people on the ground. So who owns things, who controls things, the power structures are always going to be prevalent. And we really need to factor that in. We don't want a uh, sort of a, a plethora of um, removing spaces from public domain unless it's really going to be better for those that natural world. Mm -hmm. I would hate to see some of these guardianship ideas twisted by cunning people, particularly corporates who might slip in as locals. Anyway, these are big discussions that have to happen. No, I, I, think, that, I think that is a really good comment. Um, I must come in with something about Te Uruwera and what they've, and what they've managed to do is actually not be burdened by the structures of the state. And in this particular example, I really commend everybody their statement. They call it Te Kawa or Te Uruwera. It's like the protocol, the rules that they're going to be guided by. And it's their draft or their management plan. Tikawa or Te It's on the website, um, but I can certainly find a link if people want that. Um, it is a Earth Justice Manifesto. It is the most poetic management plan <laughs> that you have ever seen. Um, I've it was so good, I had to extract huge chunks of it to just show you. You can't just summarize it. You've got to use it in its own words um, because of the alternative principles and the alternative vision it provides. And it's one thing, it's, it's like it's a true success. You, yes, you're right. You don't know when you appoint a set of guardians what it's going to come out, you know, which way they're going to go. In this particular case, they've been able to um, be fringe. They've been able to do what they thought was really needed and take a completely radical um, view, um, radical in our mainstream wine, mindset, right, view about... Yeah, it's always going to uh, depend on the structures of the people. Yeah, sure. Right, it's brilliant. And um, this is actually why I think I've commented that I don't like, I don't like, I have to say this, well, sorry to the North Americans, I don't like the approach of just according personality and then leaving it to anybody to go to court to say, I want to be that person's guardian. I want, I've got legal, I want legal standing to represent that river, set of trees, whatever, you know, should trees have standing? Standing's not enough. You need guardianship bodies because, I mean, I've been saying this for a while, but look at what's happened with, you know, your Citizens United. Look at what's happened with what everyone wants to say, well, I can exercise that, right? And so who's going to be speaking for the trees next? It's going to be anyone who goes to court first and has the biggest pockets, probably. Yeah, so power, I think you need corruption. to set up, set up those systems <laughs> properly. And in a culturally sensitive context, it can't be one size fits all. Mm. I think there we're we at a So <laughs> I think we've proven the point that there is lots and lots to talk about here. We have actually many more questions, and I, we don't actually have time to address them. I want to just pose a couple of the questions that have been asked just so that 
um, so that you, Catherine and Michelle, but also our whole audience knows the kinds of questions that have been that have been posed just for for Catherine and Michelle to think about, but obviously for us all to think about. One question sort of picking up directly on, on the last point that was made is whether we can accomplish any of the things that we're trying to accomplish um, with the exist within the existing capitalist system that exists in so much of the world, um, or whether the problem really is capitalism and do we need to get rid of that. So that is one whole area that we might consider for another webinar another day. Maybe. No, it's a short answer. Um, no, we can't do it with pure <laughs> capitalism. Sorry, we can't. We can't <laughs> <laughs> um, but the question is sort of how much do we have to get rid of it? And then the other, on sort of on the other side, asking you to think maybe with a different part of your brain about these issues is uh, also picks up in some of the comments that were made earlier, but what is the role of religion in Australia and New Zealand in thinking about these things? So sort of the conceptual, the pragmatic, and, um, and again, these are obviously much bigger questions than we, have, than we have time to address here. So I just want to thank you, Catherine and Michelle, so much for sharing your wisdom and your insights and your time with us. Uh, this was just extraordinarily thought provoking. And, um, and I wish you could hear the worldwide applause for, uh, for what you've been talking to us about. So thank you so much. Let me just thank say- you, Aaron. No, thank um, you, Erin, for doing a great job and being so <laughs> wonderfully enthusiastic and knowledgeable as usual. <laughs> thank you. Um, so as we've just heard, let me just say a few words in, in closing. As we've just been hearing, we are involved in a most ambitious project, right? We've been privileged to have spent the last few hours with some of the people who have been most involved in pushing this ambitious agenda forward, not only of changing the law, but of changing the way we think about law, changing the very nature of legal rights, changing our mindsets, as we've just heard, changing culture, changing the very nature of our, wor of our world and the way we understand our world and build knowledge in order to actually shift the global paradigm so that it actually might meet the challenges of the day. Because we're interested in these issues, not only as a philosophic or epistemic or even anthropologic matter, but we're interested because as lawyers, we have problems to solve, enormous global pressing environmental and climatic problems. The predictions and the present day descriptions of what's going on in our environment, in our climate, can sometimes seem unimaginably dire. Hence Thomas's question earlier on um, in, in today's discussion, what gives you hope? Which I think is a question that we should all be continually focusing on. So the question that we're really trying to deal with here is how do we learn from each other and how do we learn from each other's diverse perspectives in order to develop ways to implement the change that will actually help the earth heal and help um, humans live with dignity in a healthy environment. When we were organizing this conference, we thought about doing it in one day, and then we thought that, it, that the discussion was going to be so rich and, and so comprehensive um, and so complex, really, that we thought it would be best to split it over two sessions, over two days for most of the world. Um, so we, we thought that we would give you a little bit of a break to reflect on what you've heard and to prepare for what's still to come. We'll start again at 11 a.m. New York time on Friday morning with opening presentations from Jimmy May and Thomas Lindsay. And then we'll continue on our global tour with visits to or visits from Asia Europe and North America. So for now, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us now today. Uh, we wish you all a very good day, a good evening, a good night before we reconvene in a few hours. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. <laughs>